What's up gangsters? It is time for a how to do stuff video and I'm just going to warn you right now this one's going to be long. It is definitely over an hour. Um, I've already made it and edited it so I know that but it is what it is. Uh, this video is uh, kind of a collection of my sort of tips and tricks for adding detail uh, to your models in the form of wires, hoses, cables, uh, tubing, piping, whatever you want to call it, anything that contributes to the flow of fluids or electrons. <laughs> um, and it's the kind of thing that, you know, you typically are going to do with little bits of wire, uh, tubing, um, stretched spruce, people like to use that. Anyway, um, I want to get right to it because it is going to be long and this is, again, not meant to be comprehensive. This is the way that I do it, and these are some things that I think work pretty well. So let's check it out. Okay, so let's get into this uh, by uh, starting with the ending. <laughs> uh, this is the end goal. This is when I do detail work, this is basically what I'm after. I want to, um, I guess I should say first, this is the Tamiya 132nd scale Spitfire uh, Merlin. Um, and uh, what I want to do with this thing is just basically add enough detail to fill up some of the empty space. Um, this thing is beautifully molded and it's got a lot of great detail and it goes together really wonderfully, but it, it does end up feeling kind of empty when if you just you know put it together straight out of the box. There's quite a bit of room back here behind the engine um, that is normally full of, of stuff. And I'll show you some pictures here in a minute that, uh, to illustrate that. But basically, uh, without just getting completely ridiculous, what I'm after is just enough to busy it up in an authentic looking way that represents a, you know, a pretty close facsimile of the real thing. It's not going to be exact. Again, it's just supposed to be kind of close. And when I show you the pictures, you'll be able to kind of judge for yourself how well I've accomplished that. The, uh, the, this thing is going to end up having the, um, the, the bottom and uh, left side cowlings uh, permanently fixed. So basically you won't see anything over here below this line right here. And so... There's not any detail added under here. I just basically disappear some of the hoses and things into this area. And I'll talk about that again in a minute. Um, I've also uh, done a similar thing to the cockpit. Um, and I'll have to peel a little tape back, but I can show you that. I've got it, I've got it covered up so the bugs stay out. Um, but while I'm doing that, just to kind of give you an overall level of, of what the effort added up to be, uh, with like the engine detail and, and what I'm, what I'm adding here, I've kept track of the hours because this is a, uh, it is a commission build, um, not to make a big deal out of that, but if I'm going to do something to get paid, then I want to know, you know, kind of how my hours go so that I can sort of evaluate my success from a business case standpoint and <laughs> mostly figure out how little I'm getting paid per hour. And, and one thing is for sure, it is tough to get paid for doing this kind of detail work because it is so tedious and, and so slow. But the visual impact really can be satisfying, you know. So if you don't care how long it takes, then it's, it's to me it's worth doing. And I basically, I just kind of discount all the hours that I've spent uh, on this. Um, I spent about 40 hours doing the uh, detail work on the engine and about the same amount doing the detail work in the cockpit. Uh, so... At this point, that's literally like half of the total build time. But if you take a look in there, I may have to drag the light down here so you can see inside. But if you take a look in there, you can see, um, if the camera will focus, 
you can see, I just, I just don't know that I'm gonna be able to get this lit up well enough to where it shows, just awkward. Um, but anyway, you can see there's an oxygen hose in there if the camera will focus on it. If, uh, if I could get down in there with the light, um, I don't know, here, let's try this. I have a flashlight on my iPhone. Maybe that'll do it. Let's see if I can manipulate all of this effectively enough. And this is kind of something that you have to evaluate when you decide whether or not you want to do this. You know, is it really worth the effort given the visibility of, of any of this stuff? Yeah, I don't think this is really gonna, <laughs> this is not really gonna work. It's just getting the, getting the uh, camera in there um, uh, effectively, uh, you know, on video is just, there it goes maybe, there we go. It's just difficult on video, but you can see um, that there's quite a bit of stuff added in there. I forget how many individual bits of wire and, and uh, so forth are in the cockpit, but on the engine, um, it ended up being about, uh, I think I added about 40 uh, pieces of, of, of wire and tube. Um, and so you could sort of do the do the math and it must have taken me about an hour for each bit. So anyway, just to kind of give you an overall picture of what this takes me, and I am slow in general, um, but I don't think I'm really a huge amount slower on this stuff than I would be if I, you know, if I, if I didn't have dexterity issues. Um, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, at any rate, um, that's kind of the end result that I'm going for. And now that you've seen what I've, what I was working towards, I will tell you basically how I did it. Um, the first thing that I'm going to cover is materials. Um, because I find that materials really make a, a, a big difference in how well this goes. I've just learned as I've, as I've done this, done more and more of this uh, over time, that some materials will make your life really, really hard, and then some materials will make things just much, much easier. Um, so, the first thing is, and this is probably, this might be the most important of the, all the materials, is good reference photos. You can see I've got a whole stack of these here that I've just run out on my cheap uh, uh, color inkjet printer that give me some idea of, you know, what the real thing looks like. And um, you can see, like I said, that it's pretty busy in there with this Merlin. It's got tons and tons of hoses and tubes and things. And this is a nice period photograph that shows uh, engine detail really well. Um, this one was a, a hard to find one, but really important because it shows the spark plug loom that runs across the top of the engine. And you got 12 spark plug wires coming out of that because the Merlin has two spark plugs per cylinder. So you've got six on each side down below the cylinders, and then you've got these these, tw these uh, 12 that are up on top. Then you've got these tubes here, which I did not add, and I'm not sure what they are. I think they might be water injection um, because uh, those are the, the, the cooling manifolds um, right there. And so these may, these, these lines may be coming off of that and routing some of that water elsewhere. I'm not really sure, I'll tell you the truth, I don't know. I, I, that could be just, what I said about that could just be really stupid and wild speculation. But part of the fun for me in doing this is figuring out what these systems uh, do. Because I just, you know, I like the engineering aspect of it. But point is, these photographs 
are super, super helpful. I mean, you just really can't get by without these things. And uh, so you've got to have those. Those are, those, that's, that's your, your number one thing because that's going to help you, uh, you know, plan, plan out your, your work. And planning really is important, both kind of on a strategic and a tactical level. And uh, let me talk about what I mean by that. Strategically, you have to figure out kind of what your overall look is that you're going for. And, um, and then also, you have to figure out how you're going to accomplish it given the overall assembly uh, order that, you, that you're going to do. Uh, so like with this thing, what I had to figure out was what needs to be on the engine hanger subassembly uh, and what needs to be attached to the engine itself. And then how am I going to combine those two things without screwing anything up, you know, and still being able to make some of the connections, which connections have to be made before, um, you know, to each subassembly, and then which connections have to be made afterwards. Like this, this little one here obviously has to be made after the engine is already installed in the hangers because it connects the two things. So that's what I kind of mean by strategics. Tactics are down to the nitty gritty. How specifically are you going to route this cable or this hose or this wire or whatever? How are you going to fasten the ends of it? How are you going to secure it along the route uh, as, as you go? And what specific techniques will you use to do that? So the uh, overall strategy, you know, that's just something you kind of have to figure out. But the specific tactics, that's where the, um, that's where your materials come in. So let me, uh, let me get into that. The basic thing that I use probably more than anything else is wire. And I have a whole collection of wire. And I think this is really important. It may sound like it's obvious, but I was having a conversation with a guy the other night on uh, Facebook, and we were talking about this. We were talking about some of the work that he was doing, uh, where he had uh, you know done a bunch of cables and hoses, and, and, and he was struggling to get his cables and hoses looking realistic because they were not... Um, neatly bent, um, they were not uh, consistent, you know, with bend radii, um, and the individual little runs and things were not straight. It just, you know, unfortunately, it just, it just didn't look, it just didn't look very squared away. And with things like hydraulic tubing, especially, that's that's important because. You know, when you look at this, you can see like all of these tubes that run along like, like here. See how neatly they're bent and how consistent the radii are with the bend? I mean, that's because that's a thing. You know, when, when, when the craftsmen and the assemblers that put this kind of thing together in real life are doing it, they're using tubing benders and they're starting with a straight length of tubing, whereas we're starting with rolls of wire. So there are steps you have to take uh, in order to kind of be able to recreate that look and, and, and make it look realistic. On the other hand, if it's just a hose or a, an electrical cable, you know, it has a different sort of characteristic to it. Um, it may just, you know, it may just look, uh, well, I mean, you can see like the difference here. You can see like these, these hoses right here, well, they just kind of drape in there and they have whatever radius they have. Whereas these are copper or brass or aluminum tubes that have been bent, like I said, with tubing benders. You know, you've got this thing right here. That's just a loose hanging wire. You've got this cable coming from the uh, temperature sensor right here that just kind of drapes along here and gets fastened in a couple of places, but really it just kind of drapes in there naturally. And so you have to sort of account for the variation in those things if you want it to look authentic. And that's where different types of wire come into play. But what I use most of the time is I use this lead wire. 
this stuff is fantastic. I got this from Bass Pro Shops. You can get it from other fishing supply houses. And it's great because this whole box of, of six rolls was about 20 bucks. And I know there are model, model companies that sell this stuff in little packages, and it's absurdly expensive. I, I would never waste money that way. Um, you get like, you know, six feet for 10 bucks as opposed to what all you get here for, for 20. But the great thing is it's got sizes that go from 10 thousandths of an inch, um, 15, uh, 20, 25, um, 30, and then 35, which is basically uh, just under uh, a millimeter. You can see the biggest stuff there. And this will cover so much of what you need to do. All right, so that's an essential. I just, I, I, when I, I, when I first started doing this kind of stuff, I was using whatever wire I could find, and I was just miserable. I struggled so much trying to get good bins, uh, because like steel wire, uh, you know, copper wire tends to be pretty hard. If you're just taking wire out of electronics or whatever, that sounds really smart and frugal, but the problem is that the material properties just don't lend themselves to, to making this job as, as easy or effective as it could be. So I buy a lot of this kind of stuff um, on Amazon. Um, the uh, people who do beading and jewelry, they use a lot of these types of wires. This is a stainless steel artistic wire. I rarely use this one because even, I mean, even at 13 thousandths of an inch thick, um, because it's stainless steel wire, it's pretty stiff. But I do use it sometimes. It's got a, you know, it's got a good color if I want to replicate a, a, steel, uh, a steel tubing. Um, then, you know, you've got different sizes. Uh, it's important to have some really small stuff. You can see this is a silver wire. It's it's pretty nice and soft, six thousandths of an inch. Um, this one, same thing, but slightly larger, ten thousandths of an inch. Um, and then um, I've got some really nice small stuff. This is a soft copper wire that also comes from the fly tying supply guys, the fishing dudes. I think this is six thousandths, and this is pretty handy when you need something in black. You don't want to uh, have to paint it, obviously. That's a hassle, but I, I will talk about how to paint it if you need to. Um, anyway, this stuff is great. It forms real easily. Um, it's what I used to do that temperature sensor uh uh, cable. You can see it maybe running along the uh, bottom of that hose there. It's, you know, you can kind of see it poking out there and, and, and running along the bottom of that, uh, of that uh, coolant tubing. Um, and I'll explain how I, I did that. Uh, so that's, that's real handy. And, and this stuff, comes in a few different sizes and a whole bunch of different colors. But most of the colors are kind of useless because they end up being these anodized looking metallic colors that don't really represent much that, that, that we do. But the copper colored, the gold colored, those might also be useful. Now I needed uh, also some, some really, really fine stuff occasionally. Um, this one, you can see how fine that stuff is. This is nickel silver wire, and I believe it's four thousandths. Um, it's a, it's just slightly smaller, you can see, than this black stuff. But you know, it's really good when you need to get down that small. Um, this one is my smallest one. This is also nickel silver uh, or nickel chrome wire, and this you can see, 0.05 millimeters um, and it is the smallest stuff that I've got I mean it's practically like hair and where this is really good is uh, this is about the right size if you're doing a uh, like a one of these 1 12th uh, super bike models from Tamiya and you need to want to show the why the safety wire that sometimes gets wrapped around the handlebar grips a lot of dudes do that detail, but they make it too big, and it's just not realistic. Because in reality, that wire is—it's not—it's not really huge wire. It's like, it's like half millimeter wire, in real life, and so it's pretty easy to get it uh, over scale. 
um, and this is the smallest stuff that I've been able to find and it and it's nice for that so you know this stuff works for all genres aircraft armor motorcycles cars whatever um, but anyway I'm gonna throw these back in the drawer um, you can kind of you can kind of see um, what I mean by having lots of arrows in your quiver um, you know collect it's it's worthwhile to collect a a range of of all the sizes that you might need according to uh, the types of details that you're going to create and the scales that you're going to work in um, this is some wire that came with some detail up parts for car models and it's kind of nice because it's copper wire that's been it's got a plastic coating on it so, you know, it's good for representing certain types of things, if the camera would focus on it, please. Um, and it's not too stiff. Um, you know, it, it takes, a nice, takes a nice bend like that, so that, that works pretty good. So, that takes care of the cables and hoses themselves. All right? But, in order for this kind of thing to look realistic, um, you've got to also consider the ends. Uh, because none of these things in real life just get stabbed straight into whatever it is that they are servicing. I mean, if when you look at this picture in particular, you can see all kinds of hardware, um, fittings, clamps, you know, just different things um, that, you know, if you really want to represent this thing realistically, you've got to do some of that. Um, you know, like right here, you've got a pipe fitting that screws into the, the back of that gizmo, whatever it is. Same thing here on the air compressor. There's a pipe fitting there that screws into the back of the, of the cylinder. You can see where that copper line comes up over there, that there's a, a, a tubing fitting there on the end of that. Um, just all over the place. There's, there's just never anything that just pokes straight into something else. Um, you've got some, this is a restored Spitfire obviously, you've got these red and blue anodized uh, fittings here, um, up here where the spark plug wires go into this, to the, to the rack. You've got these brass fittings. Um, so accounting for those really uh, helps increase the realism a lot. Um, but it also does something else, and that's help you with engineering your attachment points so that they're more secure. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But again, you can see here in this picture how every single one of these hoses and, and, and tubes has some type of a mechanical fitting on the end of it. So how do you, how do you replicate that? All right, well, tubing, that's the answer. And I have three different types of tubing that I use for that. I've got this brass tubing and I've got some aluminum tubing. And both of these come from Albion, which um, if you're not familiar with Albion uh, alloys, these guys produce a lot of really neat stuff. A lot of really cool brass and aluminum and, and uh, nickel silver metal shapes. Um, you know, aside even from tubes, they've got little you know, channels and, and eye beams and stuff, just different things. Uh, but the tubing is the stuff that I find most useful. And you get these slide fit tube fat packs that you can see give you a range of different sizes. And the brass tubing has a really, really thin wall. Um, you can kind of see there how thin the, the wall is. And so that can work really good in certain circumstances. The aluminum tubing is uh, is a little bit thicker, but these are are indispensable, um, and I'll talk about the the differences in each one um, in a minute. But there's a third thing that is also really really a game changer, and that's this stuff here. This is 
Um, this is from a company called Hairline. You can kind of see the label down in there. This also is from the Fly Tying Supply folks. And this tubing is basically a lot like the tubing, and there's a piece of it actually in here, a um, lot like the uh, PVC uh, tubing that you will find in some Tamiya kits that's about a millimeter outside diameter. Here's a, a piece of it right here. Okay, it's a nice thin wall vinyl tubing. But it's too big for most of the things that you're going to want to do. This stuff, this hairline tubing is fantastic. It comes in three sizes. Large, midge, and small. Midge, for whatever reason, is that's a fly tying term, a fishing term, and it, it's basically the medium size. And you can see the differences, okay? This one right here is the large size, and it is slightly smaller than one millimeter, just a little bit smaller than that um, Tamiya stuff. The midge is this one right here. That's the medium size one, and you can see what's going on with that. If it'll focus, there you go. And then the uh, small, you can see how much smaller it is, and that's it right there. Now, what is what the, the challenge with all of these little bits of tubing? Well, first, I guess I should should say, why do you need this? How does this help you? All right, if you look at what I've done here with this, uh, with this engine, as you can see, like look here by the air compressor, okay? That hose coming out of there has a little fitting on the end of it. Both of those hoses do. Those are both pieces of Albion aluminum tubing. Um, if you look at the uh, cable coming out of the temperature probe there, you can see it's got a little black housing at the end of it. That's a little piece of that uh, vinyl midge tubing. All right, these um, uh, th those green hoses or tubes that run along there, I actually did those with the vinyl tubing as well, as opposed to using wire. If you look down inside there on the engine block, there's some. I believe those are oil lines. You can see those all have an aluminum tubing uh, fitting at, at, at the end there. Um, okay, same thing here with the big cable that goes from the magneto down there. You can see that curls up there and connects to the spark plug wire loom. Okay, that's a piece of lead wire that's, that's the, the 30 thousandths lead wire. And the fitting on the end of the of the loom itself, and the loom itself is a straight piece of evergreen styrene rod that I drilled 12 holes in. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Same thing for the one on the side here. That's the same thing, styrene rod with six holes drilled in it. Um, but you can see it has a fitting on the end of it that the lead wire plugs into, and I've also added uh, a fitting to the, the, the magneto itself. You can kind of see down in there. Those are brass tubing. Um, if I flip this over, you can see kind of down in here um, that uh, tank right there. It's got a brass fitting underneath it that a hose plugs into. That's a piece of brass tubing. Um, so you can see what I'm using that those little pieces of, of tubing for. And which one I use is dependent upon, uh, first of all, on size. Because the idea is that you're going to take a tiny little piece of your tubing and it's got to slide over the end of the wire that's being used to replicate that particular hose or, or whatever it is. So you first of all pick your, your, your wire according to the scale and size that you need. Then you select the tubing that will slide fit as close as possible over, over the top of it. And that's how you decide you know, which material it's, it's going to be. Um, 
I also select it based on color sometimes or material. I mean, if I know that it needs to be a silver fitting, then I'm going to try to use the aluminum tubing because then I don't have to paint it. I get a natural metal finish. Same thing with the brass stuff. But if it's not the right size, it's not the right size. So the first thing is size. Second thing is material. And then there's also how easy is it to cut. And, and this is where, <laughs> this is one of those deals um, uh, that you just have to learn to do. There are guys that can do this over and over perfectly and get perfect little cut, perfect little sections. And it's, it's I, I'm envious of those guys. I can do it with this bra with this aluminum tubing you you need a brand new uh a brand new blade really this blade is not and i'll get away with it on this aluminum but basically you just have to start rolling it and pretty quickly you'll see that it will cut off that tiny piece of tubing and then you're gonna just take and uh, maybe I can do this without my magnifiers on. <laughs> I should add that, at least for me, that a really good set of magnifying glasses, like uh, an Optivisor, is also an essential piece of, of kit for this. Because, you know, this is obviously precision work, all right? And I got lucky. Better to be lucky than good, sometimes. And you can see how I've slipped that little piece of aluminum tubing over that piece of wire. And I could now just wick a tiny bit of extra thin CA into that and secure it right there before I install it. Um, or I could wait until after the tubing is in place and then slide the fitting down to the right spot and then glue it. But point being is this is what the tubing is for. That's how you use it. And that's why this vinyl stuff is so fantastic because obviously being as, uh, you know, as, as, as soft as it is, it's super, super easy to cut. Um, you just, I mean, it's, it's great. You just pick your, pick your length. If you can control it, pick your length. And whoops, of course, now that I'm doing it on camera, it's not that easy. This blade's pretty dull, but you can see what I've done there. I just chopped off that tiny little, little section there. And this is nice because you can make them, you know, pretty much as long or, or short as you need to. Um, and there you go. That's how you get those little fittings and then you can paint those. You gotta cut them much straighter than I did there. These are obviously very crooked, so don't do that. But this tubing, this, this vinyl tubing, it's a game changer. It makes this job so, so much easier because it, it's just so quick and easy to cut. And it's cheap. Uh, it's like two bucks for a package of it. Uh, it comes in three different sizes, like I said, and it comes in like 20 different colors. So, you know, you can see all I have is black and clear and green, but there's a whole bunch more colors that look really, really good. So this stuff is great. You can find it on Amazon or just, uh, you know, if you don't live in the United States, you might have to do some Googling and searching, but uh, it is, it's well worth the effort to, to find that stuff. Because with all of these materials that I've talked about, um, the tubing and the wire, that's, uh, that's how I did 100% of this stuff. Um, what it comes down to then is just using different methods to create different types of, uh, of, of hardware, sort of depending on what you're trying to represent, okay? So... Um, you know, and, and in doing what's easy. So uh, there's different methods, but let me talk about, um, first of all, the basic tactic for how I do these. Uh, because again, being methodical about this and using using good methods really is, is what 
makes a lot of difference. So let me get a piece of paper here. I'm not going to do this on camera because we all, anybody who's watched knows my history of trying to do stuff on camera. It's not pretty. Um, and this is just way better illustrated at much larger than life size anyway. So this is the basic method. All right. Let's say that I have this uh, gizmo here and it has a fitting uh, sticking out of it and this is the molded plastic part all right um, and um, this is an important part of your planning is to look over all of the parts in the kit uh, as you're kind of gearing up to do this and look at the way that they're molded and look for attachment points. One of the really wonderful things about this thing is that Tamiya, Tamiya gives you tons and tons of attachment points. And you may have to do some measuring and so forth, but bottom line is use the, use the attachment points that they give you as much as possible um, because those are at least going to be an approximation of where the real thing is uh, is supposed to go. So let's say you've got this plastic piece that uh, has uh, that that has an attachment point on it, and now you're going to get to the nitty gritty of how this is actually done. And so I guess I should talk about the tools. I've talked about the materials that you need. You can't uh, skip talking about the tools, and this is. As you've probably guessed, this is the most important thing, all right? Some really good, really small drill bits. And I have two different types here. These are, um, uh, I'm sure you guys have all seen these. These are circuit board drill bits. They're great. You, you get them cheap. You get them in a bunch of sizes. Uh, the only disadvantage to these is that they are super, super brittle. Like you breathe on them and they snap. You can see that 0.2 millimeter one right there. I brushed it with my sleeve a couple days ago, getting another one out of the rack here, and I just snapped it right off. Didn't even feel it break, because it's so fine. So I only use these pretty much when I'm drilling a through hole, because if you're drilling a blind hole and you snap one off, now you've got the problem of extracting that little bit of broken drill out of the hole that you were, you were drilling. So for blind holes, I try to use these as much as possible. This is an ancient little set of, of wire size, high speed steel twist drills that go clear down to um, 13 and a half thousandths is the smallest size. Uh, so for you metric guys, that's just a, a you know, that's, that's about 0.3 millimeters. Um, now, how do, I, how do I actually drill? How do I actually operate these? I'm sure you're assuming that I use a pin vise. And that's not a bad assumption. And for most of you guys that have good dexterity, a pin vise is probably fine. I have uh, a couple of different ones. Um, I've got this really, really cool one that Bill West, who's a member of Scale Modeler's Critique Group, makes. And he made mine custom with the golf ball on the end of it, so it's easy for me to hold on to. But you can see it's set up specifically for those circuit board type drills. It only takes the one size shank and you lock it in there with that Allen screw. And that's really good for the larger size bits where they tend to, to snag and you need a little bit more torque. And they'll turn inside of a little, uh, you know, three jaw chuck like this that you just finger tighten. But this is also a nice pin vise. You can see I added a bolt or a nut on the end of it to make it a little easier to hang on to. But you can get these for like 10 bucks off Amazon. But you know, you want the uh, three jaw chuck if you're gonna use the wire drills because obviously they don't all have the same size shank. But because I am uh, not in possession of my full amount of manual dexterity anymore. And because I'm just basically lazy, I like power tools. And you're like, what? How can you use a power tool for something this small? Well, this is the Proxon Miz 1, and it is 
it's one of the smartest things I ever bought. Um, that's how it, that's how it turns. Now, how am I turning it with both hands? Okay, this is the power switch, and it's just basically a trigger switch, and I have it taped down so that it's always on. And this thing is connected to my power supply that I use for all of my Proxon tools. And upstream from that is the foot switch. So I can, you know, have both hands free and I can kick it with my toe and turn it on. And it turns 250 RPM and it's got an old school three jaw chuck that you can crank down with a chuck key if you need to. But oftentimes just finger tight is, is good enough. Now, this may blow your mind that I am using this gigantic thing with these tiny, tiny drill bits to drill 0 0.4, 0 0.3, whatever, millimeter holes in stuff like this, okay? But like if you look at the top of that little storage tank there, that's exactly what's happened. I've got, I drilled a couple of 0.4 millimeter holes and, a, and then a larger one uh, using this thing. And its its mass is actually what works in my favor because it's pretty heavy and that means that it's really stable. I, I'm fortunate enough that my hands don't shake anyway, but the fact that this thing is just so rock solid and turns so nice and slow means that it's really easy to control. Um, so, and when you've got to do, you know, I mean, if you've got, if you've got 40 little pieces of wire, that means you've got at least 40 holes to drill and maybe more than that if some of those connect at both ends. Now, if you're gonna be drilling all those holes, okay, you really have to have a really, really sharp center punch, okay? And that's what this is. This is uh, a pretty expensive scriber, actually, that I got that, uh, um, I forget what the name of it is, but um, I think UMP also sells these, but they, they you can get various uh, bits for the ends of them. This is the 10 degree pointed one. And I use it for scribing occasionally, but where I really like it is for using it as a center punch. You can see just how super, super sharp it is. And you've got to have that because when you're trying to land a drill bit in the middle of a of a cylinder that represents a fitting like this that is only let's say it's let's say it's uh, uh, one or two millimeters in diameter and you want to drill a hole right in the middle of it you need to be precise and accurate right um, and so you need to center punch that first. So this is the actual basic method for almost all of these that I, that I use. First thing that I do is I center punch and then I drill, okay? So then once you've got the thing uh, drilled, okay, you've got your little fitting here and you've got that little hole drilled in the end of it, now what you do is you come along with your piece of wire uh, and just poke that straight in there and then wick a little bit of extra thin super glue onto it to secure it. And then if you've already got your little sleeve that represents your fitting, either already secured, uh, I tend to glue the wire in first and then slide the fitting down um, so then you end up with something that looks like this. When it's all said and done, there's the, the wire poking in there, and then there's the fitting on the outside of it. And you just wick a little bit of extra thin CA in here, and in here, and that will secure that thing plenty good enough for you to be able to do the next step, okay? And this is, this is really important. I feel like this is one of the number one things to being successful with this is, is planning out 
and methodically making all of these attachment points. I know it seems tedious, but believe it or not, I did that for every single one of these wires and hoses and whatever that are on here. Um, every single one of them is secured at at least one end using this method. And that's part of why it takes so long. But it makes your life a lot easier when you come to the next step. And that is to actually route the thing. Okay. Because what you want to do is, is tie one end of it down securely enough that you can work the, the, the length of it and glue it down bit by bit uh, uh, without, without pulling it out of where you've attached it to. And let me kind of explain what I mean. All right, this is gonna be a little bit difficult maybe to show, but let me tell I've got this little piece of, of, of lead wire that's a scrap. So let me uh, see here if I can, I will fasten it to this piece of paper. Okay, so let's assume that this is going to be um, a, a, a tubing run, all right? Now, before I do that, though, I should, I should bring up one thing. You have to decide, is this a piece of, of mechanical tubing that's made out of metal, or is this a piece of, of a hose that can just lay naturally? If it's a piece of hose, then you don't really need to do much because, you know, you can, you can basically drape it, uh, however you want to. But if it's going to be a piece of mechanical tubing, you really need to straighten it first so that it looks right. And what I do, this is just my box that I keep all my airbrush cleaning supplies in. And I just use that as a wood block. And you saw how I rolled it back and forth there. Now I have a perfectly straight piece of wire. That one little step right there will make a huge difference in how neat and tidy your work looks. Now, that works really good to straighten lead wire or anything else that's dead soft. I forgot to show you guys, I think, but I also have some dead soft brass wire that's really nice. Um, let me see if I can see that in here. Uh, nope, different, different drawer. What dead soft means, that's a heat treat, that's an engineering heat treat term. Uh, anytime you, you heat treat a piece of metal, um, it gets classified according to how hard it is um, based on the heat treat cycle. And dead soft means basically no heat treat at all. And you can see this is 0.4 millimeter brass wire, so it doesn't need to be painted to get a perfectly realistic look for brass tubing. And it's dead soft. And what that means is that if you take and bend it, not only does it bend really easily, but it stays bent, okay? If it's heat treated to anything more than dead soft, it's gonna have a tendency to wanna spring back. And that also will make a big difference in how, in how good uh, all of your work looks. And it's dead soft wire that, that where this, this technique of, of rolling it uh, works really well. Um, there's a couple of other techniques that you can use to straighten a piece of wire. Sometimes you can just take it and hold down one end of it and just apply a lot of pressure and just run your finger over it and it'll, and it'll straighten out. This is another piece of lead wire that's been painted and I'll, I'll explain how I did that too. Um, but you know, you can just roll it around and pull on it and straighten it and you can do a pretty decent job of, of that. If you have wire that is a little stiffer than dead soft, but still, you know, not super strong, like this uh, silver artist's wire, you can stretch it straight. And so what I'll do with this stuff is I'll just grab one end of it in the in 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 the pliers, a pair like a little pair of vice grips, or I just have a, a little pair of miniature channel locks that I can use for that. And I'll grab one end of it with that. And to 
if it's really fine wire and I'm strong enough, I'll just leave the other end attached to the, the spool and you just pull it and you'll feel it give. And as soon as you feel it gives, that, mean, that means that it's stretched a little bit. And when you release the tension, it'll be nice and straight like that. You know, there's just other, other ways you can engineer that where you, you know, double up, uh, you make a loop of it and, uh, you know, attach one of it to the leg of a table and then grab the other end of it with your pliers or whatever. But bottom line is, if you're, if you're you know, if you're clever, you can come up with a way to pull that wire and straighten it by stretching. And then you've got this really nice bit of, of uh, miniature facsimile tubing. Okay, so once you've done that, once you've decided if you need your wire to be straight or if it can be floppy or whatever, all right, then you glue it down, all right? You glue the one end of it. So we're pretending that this piece of masking tape is this glue joint uh, right here where we've secured this and uh, added the fitting and, and all of that and it's, and it's now glued down. So what you wanna do is calculate where is your first bend? And I don't literally mean calculate, I just mean figure out where is your first bend and put a little bit of, of glue maybe upstream from that. Like let's say we know that this thing needs to bend right about here. So I may wick a little bit of CA in at this point right here. Then I'm going to take something that's the right diameter, okay? Like this is a cocktail stick. And I put it in place here. And then I bend that wire and form it around that piece of wood. And that gives me a nice, neat radius like that. And you can use toothpicks or whatever to get the right curvature. Okay, now I apply another bit of glue right here to hold that in place. And then take uh, my forming tool and again, hold it down and bend it around that one. You go a little too far, then you have to unbend it and that might not look good, but there you go, see? You have a nice, very neat, very purposeful, very intentionally bent looking piece of miniature tubing. And it, it you know, it, you just kind of have to, like if you're working inside of a wheel well or, um, you know, working along a, uh, a, you know, a frame member like I was here, basically it's just a matter of very slowly and patiently working your way along the length of it. Okay, like, like take, uh, take these green uh, tubes right here. So what I did is I secured them up here to this tank and then I started working my way along. I, I, I bent it, and this is actually some of that midge tubing, so it was easy to just form it, and it wants to spring back, but I held it in place, and then tacked it down with some glue, uh, you know, right here, and then just kept working my way along. Okay, same thing with the lead that comes from the temperature probe. I've got a hole drilled in the fuselage back, or the firewall back here, right down here, brought the tube out, make sure it made sure that it was, had plenty of extra length to it, brought it out, and I used a different trick to secure it uh, along the route, okay? And this gets a little bit, this gets a little bit freaky, but this is really cool. If you look at that, you'll notice that it has a black band around it at three different places along the route. And what I did is I used tape. Okay, this is Izu masking tape that is pre-cut. This is 0.4 millimeters wide, so it's great for making straps to hold down tubes and wires. And what I do is I take uh, a little piece of it and cut it off. 
and I stick it down to this little cutting board that I've got and I literally color it with a Sharpie. Okay, so it's black already. Don't have to worry about painting it and it ends up being perfectly color separated between the black and the green right there. Okay, you can also use like a Molotow chrome marker. You can see I've got some right there that's painted chrome to replicate a silver hose clamp. All right, whatever color you need, you can just do it on your little cutting board. This is a piece of ultra high molecular weight polyethylene that I use as a cutting board. It'll peel right back off of there after you cut it to the right length. And what I do with those is I take, and, 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 and you can also, you don't have to buy expensive Izu tape that's pre-cut to length. You can obviously use different ways of cutting strips of tape to the right width yourself. One way to do that, this is another one of my favorite tools, is this Infini Easy Cut uh, Type A cutting uh, guide. You can see it's got grooves laser cut in it that will guide you so that you can cut little skinny strips of tape in widths that range from 0.4 millimeter all the way up to one millimeter. So you can do it that way. You know, if you're cleverer than I am and not a tool whore and you want to just do it freehand or whatever, point being is these little strips of tape are your lifesaver when it comes to securing something like this because it's really difficult, obviously, to place a 0.4 millimeter thick piece of wire on a round pipe like that black one is and glue it perfectly and then move on to the next place where you're following the bends of the pipe that it's mounted to. So what you do is you stick the little piece of tape on and maybe I should, maybe this is something else where it's better for me to, to, to draw it. Um, I don't know. This is, I hope this is going to be effective because this is a lot of detail and, and it's going to be a long video. It's already like an hour long, but anyway, so what you do is, uh, let's say that this is the, um, this is the, the pipe that you want to add your, your, your little wire to. So take the little skinny piece of tape and I stick it on there like this. Okay, so I stick it to one side and it'll stick pretty good. And I, and I, and I do that with tweezers. Then take and wrap this one underneath it. So now it's secured around to the back side. And if you need to, add a tiny bit of, of really thin super glue. Then take your, your wire uh, and lay it into kind of this nook right here. And then take the top piece of tape and wrap it down like that. So then once you get it wrapped all the way around here and it's holding on tight uh, to, this, to this wire that you've secured here, then in a place that's going to be out of sight, you know, like on this thing, it's obviously the back side of it's not ever going to be seen. You cover it over with a little bit of extra thin CA to make sure that it stays put. And I also, I use Kicker a lot um, for this because there's times when you just, you need it to, to, to set instantly. And so in addition to this uh, Bob Smith Instacure Extra Thin CA, I use uh, Zip Kicker. And there are different brands of kickers. I People say different things about different ones. I have found this one works really good. This is just Zip Kicker. And I just shoot it into a little cup like this. And I apply it with these little disposable brushes that have this little applicator tip on the end that way if you know because you you stick the the thing into the the zip kick and then touch it to the glue and then you've got glue on the little brush and if you're using a real brush then the brush is ruined unless you're willing to clean it off with with uh debonder speaking of which 
you also need for materials besides extra thin CA, regular CA, kicker, you need some debonder because it is inevitable that at some point you will get some super glue where you don't want it and you need some debonder to be able to clean that up. This is Great Plains uh, debonder, uh, pro debonder, not sure what makes it pro, but I get it on Amazon. Works really good. It's, it's hot enough that it will remove the super glue and paint but doesn't seem to destroy uh, plastic. So anyway, you need some of that. Very handy stuff. Anyway, that is the basic strategy for how I do most and the, and, the, and the basic tactics for how I attach most of these little things. Now, there are variations on that, okay? Like, let's say this, this is what you want to do if you... Um, are going to make your your miniature hose out of a piece of wire and you're going to have these fittings on the end of it. But let's say that you want to use the uh, the hose or the little tiny vinyl tubing to be tubing, which was the case uh, here. Okay, if you look at the top of this, you can see that there's a couple of, of lines uh, coming out of that tank right there. And I actually wanted to use the tubing to replicate, you know, tubing. Because uh, it is, on the real thing, it's like a rubber hose. And so what I've done there is if, if, if this is the tank, here's the top of it, and I want to put a hose that, that comes off of it and runs down like this, drill a hole then take a short piece of wire that's bent into a whatever angle you need, typically just a right angle, so you have a little elbow that looks like that. Then insert the elbow into the hole that you just drilled, then take and, and, and glue it first because it's gonna wanna move around on you. Then take and slip your tubing over the end of it and add a little bit of CA glue in right here to secure that. If you need for this tubing to hold its shape over more of its length, like let's say that you need it to look like it naturally comes out here and then drapes down like this, and it won't hold that because it's too springy, you just make your little wire elbow longer so that it extends further in here and now, when you bend that, it'll hold its shape. And if you're careful and your sizes are correct, uh, I've done this before, sometimes it's possible to actually have a length of wire inserted through the entire length of this little piece of, of vinyl tubing. That's a rare situation where, where I've ever needed to do that. Um, and it can get pretty tedious to thread the piece of wire all the way through the, the little piece of, of, of hose but it, it does work, and uh, if you're if you're careful about it, you can you can do it. So um, let me think about this for a second. I feel like I've been talking just a mile a minute for the last hour. I can see, um, and you know it is what it is. This this video being so long is representative of the nature of this work itself. It just, you know, it is what it is. If you want to do this and you want good results, it's just going to take time, and that's all there is to it. But I think that I've done uh, about as good as I can in sort of going over um, all of this. Uh, you've seen the basic strategy. You've seen the uh, materials that I use, the wires, the uh, various types of wire, the, the tubing uh, to create the fittings on the ends. You've seen my basic method uh, and the tools that I use for uh, attaching this stuff. Um, and so I think that that is, that's really ab about it. I'm not sure what more I can say um, about how to actually do this. Okay, so uh, I was editing this and of course, as always, I discovered there was some stuff I forgot to say. So uh, one thing I kept saying was that I would talk about how to paint these wires. 
before you install them and, and so I need to make good on that. Um, so I'm just grabbing a little piece of this lead wire here and this is simple, it's not rocket science. What you do is get your piece of wire and I like to use these gripper tweezers and grab it by the end and you uh, you know on uh, your on a, on a piece of paper or a piece of tin foil or or a pallet of some kind all you do is put a drop of paint and I like to use um, these are often going to be black anyway so I'll use this black Steinle res because it seems to stick to these little wires pretty well and what you do is you just put a drop of paint on your palette lay the the wire in it and then put your finger on top of it and just drag it along like that and it'll be magically painted on all sides in fact it'll probably have too much on it and you then might take your finger and wipe off some of the excess and then you just take and set this aside with the wire hanging off of it so that it'll dry and you have a wire that's the right color or that's at least uh, primed or whatever and if you're like well but aren't they gonna isn't the paint gonna chip off while I'm installing the wire yes it might uh, some to a certain extent um, you do have to be careful and yes you may get some chips but if you chip 10% of the paint off, you're still way better off than you were going to be if you had to paint the entire wire um, once it's already in place. Because then you've got to work around all the other details. Uh, you got to make sure you get all the different sides of the wire, etc. And it's much easier to just have to touch up a few spots than anything else. I also wanted to mention something else that's good for doing hoses and so forth. And that is this type of braided line. This particular uh, version is from these guys at Annie's, however you say that. Um, this is a guy who's a really good model maker, and uh, he's made some neat products. And these bits of braided line are actually just a type of, of, of string with a braided casing on the outside uh, that approximates like, you know, some type of a braided hose covering. And you can, the, the, the Gunpla guys, uh, that's the, you know, big rope, stompy robot dudes, if you don't know. The Gunpla guys use this type of thing a lot. They have sizes of, of this sort of thing uh, of their own that you can find at places like uh, USA Gundam Store. So anyway, you know, obviously there are a lot of materials that you can use for this type of thing. What I've just tried to show you guys is the stuff that I have found to be the most effective. Now, one little bit of house cleaning that I discovered while I was um, going through the editing. When I talked about this picture and these tubes right here, I talked about, I said this is the, uh, that this is part of the water jacket. That this is a manifold that lets coolant flow into the heads. I now think that is wrong, it, it, but this highlights an issue that, that you're going to have with this sort of thing. Um, it's very difficult to tell from photos where these pipes that come out of the back of the coolant tank, and this is very much the coolant tank, of that I have no doubt. It's very difficult to tell from photos where these pipes actually connect to the, the heads. You can see that what I did, uh, because I wasn't certain, and also because there wasn't a good place to land them, I just drilled some little holes in the front of the cylinder heads and that's where I attached those pipes which are made out of that 0.35 or, or sorry uh, 0.035 inch wire um, 35 thousandths just under a millimeter um, it, anyway uh, I think that I was wrong and that those are actually part of the intake manifolds um, it just was I was just a little confused by the by the design um, and I'm even now more convinced that these may be um, that these may be water injection. I'm not I'm not sure where the fuel enters the stream on a Merlin enters the airstream. The carburetor is d way down below on the bottom of the blower. 
Um, so I'm not sure what these would be for. Um, that's why I say water injection. Anyway, if anybody knows, just 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 tell me because I want to learn. Um, but the, the 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 other point here is that you're always going to be at a disadvantage because the model kit maker is never going to have it perfect because they're limited to looking at pictures and maybe going and looking at a at a real at the real thing and then trying to translate that into something that is moldable as you know little bits of polystyrene you're going to be at a disadvantage looking at these photos because you just can't ever see every angle and every and into every nook and cranny so you just have to make the best of it and um, and remember that the objective is to uh, make it look convincing it doesn't have to be perfect it just has to look cool and convincing okay so there you go <laughs> Like I said, pretty long, um, pretty comprehensive, but certainly not all-inclusive. There are obviously other ways to do this, uh, but you know, as I said, this is just kind of the way that I've uh, developed for myself that works pretty well. So, um, you know, for you guys that were asking me about it, I hope this is helpful. For you guys that have never considered, you know, adding another level of detail to your models, uh, then I also hope that uh, this will be helpful for you guys. So. Um, at any rate, as always, I definitely appreciate you watching. Much love.